Well, can we bid you all a very warm and sincere word of welcome this evening? It's good to have you with us. We pray that God will bless our hearts tonight, encourage us and challenge us in these days that we're living in. We're going to worship together. I've been given a couple of favorites before the meeting started. So uh, the first one is 588, 588. It's a lovely old hymn that speaks of heaven and home. 588, forever with the Lord. Amen, so let it be. Life from the dead is in that word, tis immortality. 588, and we'll stand please as we worship the Lord together. And there's another one here, 475, 475, just as you remain seated, 475, I do not know what lies ahead the way I cannot see, 475, and we'll just ask you to remain seated as we sing this one together as well.
pray together, so let's seek the Lord earnestly in prayer. Let's come before his throne, praying that the Lord will speak to our hearts tonight through his word and through our brother, Mr. Webster, and pray that God's name tonight will be exalted. Father, we come again before the throne of grace this evening in the worthy and precious name of thy Son. We thank thee for the one who is described in Scripture as God's well-beloved Son, in whom thou art well pleased. We thank thee for one who is co-eternal and co-equal with God the Father and with God the Holy Spirit. We thank thee, Lord, that whenever the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of a virgin, and made under the law to redeem those that were under the law. And we thank thee tonight, O God, for thy people here in this prayer meeting. We thank thee, O God, tonight that being in by faith look back to the cross. We thank thee, O God, for thy word and for the record of the redeeming work that was wrought on our soul's behalf on Calvary. And Lord, we look away back through the ages of history to that cross where the Son of God shed his blood and bore our sins in his own body in the tree died the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. And here we are tonight. We thank thee, O God, that we're found in thy house with thy people, found singing thy praise, found with thy word in our hands, seeking thy face together. And Lord, we just lift our hearts tonight, Lord, and we acknowledge that salvation is of the Lord. We thank thee for thy faithfulness. We thank thee, O God, that we have a a God in heaven who provides for all of our needs and one who has promised to keep us in the hollow of his hand. We thank thee tonight that there's nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing, Lord, that is in this world and nothing that is in heaven above or nothing in the powers of darkness or in the principalities and powers that wage war against us that can rob us of what we are and what we have in Christ. And tonight, Lord, we pray in the Savior's name that thou wilt meet with us here. We pray for the movings of the Spirit of God in our hearts. We thank thee, Lord, for the one who has come into our midst tonight. We thank thee for our brother and for the work that he does and for the organization that he represents that has been such a blessing to the church of Jesus Christ in, in these islands. And we thank thee, Father God, for how thou hast prospered them and used them for thy glory. We thank thee for many saints of God that can testify through personal experience to the great help that the Christian Institute has been to them and their hour of need. And we thank thee, Lord, for raising up men and women who are gifted in areas, Lord, that many of us tonight know very little about. And we pray tonight for thy servant, our brother, that you'll bless him richly in this meeting and tomorrow and in the days that lie ahead. We pray that you will lead him and guide him and bless him with health and strength, and traveling mercies, Lord, and soundness of mind and body. And bless him in his own soul and encourage him in the things of God and protect him, Lord, from the wiles of the devil. Put a hedge around about him. Give him, Lord, clarity of mind and thought as he engages in the work of God. And we pray that tonight, Lord, you will open our eyes and our hearts and in these days that we're living in, give us wisdom, give us discernment, and give us the mind of Christ in all things. Protect us, Lord, from extremes, and protect us, Lord, from ignorance. And grant, O oh God, tonight that we will see things as they really are, and that, Lord, we will see that God is still on the throne, that all things are under thy feet. Give us great confidence in these days that our God is able to supply all of our needs, and the Savior has promised still to build his church. And Lord God, we look to thee for our young people tonight, growing up in this nation of ours, this fast, getting away from the things of God. Lord, we pray that it would please thee to turn the tide and grant an ear for the word of God again, and a hunger after truth and after righteousness. And we pray that thou wilt magnify the Son of God in these days. So, Lord, continue with us now and be with us in this meeting. We ask it all with thanksgiving and assurance in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, as we have said already, we're so delighted to see you tonight in the prayer meeting, and it's good to have such a good number in tonight, and we welcome you all in the Lord's great name. And if you're not a local here tonight, and you're visiting with us, you're very welcome. And if you're not in the habit of coming out on the Monday night, we're very glad to see you as well. I want to welcome tonight our good friend, Callum Webster, and we're so thankful for his life and witness and ministry and testimony, and we know that God's servant is very, very busy in these days, and we're thankful for uh, the gifts and the talents that God has given him. And we're so thankful that he has given us time to be with us tonight in this uh, season of prayer, to present the work of the Christian Institute, and to speak to things tonight that are of great concern to many Christian parents and people in schools and classrooms and colleges and churches as well. There's so much that is in opposition, as you would know, uh, to the work of Christ and to the gospel in these days. And our brother has come into our midst tonight to speak about that work. There are some little cards that have been left on your seat tonight, and that's just a mailing list. There's a little periodical that comes out from time to time uh, that updates you as to the work that the Christian Institute does and to some uh, things that are of concern in our nation from time to time. And you can put your name in that little card and sign up for the mailing list, and that'll be sent out to you. And there should be a basket as well, or the box at either side of the door there, to uh, support the work of the Christian Institute this evening. Callum has been a personal friend of mine for a number of years, and we thoroughly enjoy his ministry and his fellowship. And he's a great encouragement to us in the work of God, and we trust that we will be able to encourage our brother tonight. And Callum, it's lovely to have you with us. He's from Scotland, uh, Brodie Ferry is the place, and studied, I think, at Dundee University. I remember my brother going over there and Callum enrolled at the same time. And there's a lot of people from Lisburn in those days went to university. I never had that privilege. I went to the tech in Lisburn and that was as far as I got. And then uh, the Whitfield a little bit later on. But Callum, you're so welcome tonight, brother. May God richly bless you and encourage you. And you're very much at home tonight among friends. And we pray that God will bless you as you minister tonight. So thank you for coming and we'll hand it over to yourself. Well, thank you so much for those warm words of welcome. It is a privilege to be with you again in Lisburn. I have spoken here before, and you've changed your minister since I last spoke with you, but uh, it's always good to be here and to renew fellowship. And I will update you on the work of the Christian Institute and some of the challenges facing us at the present time. But before we do that, we want to turn to the Word of God, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and reading from verse number 13 through to uh, verse 27. Matthew chapter 7 from verse 13 through to 27. And I will address tonight in the course of the presentation a little bit about the RSC changes here in Northern Ireland. It's not the major focus tonight, but I will be addressing it as one of the issues. I will speak more, God willing, at the end of the month when I'm at the Martyrs, and I speak particularly uh, on the RSC changes. But tonight I will address it among other issues in a little bit of a shorter format. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven." Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, 
and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Well, may God bless His Word to every one of our hearts. Here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching that there are two responses to His Word. There are those who put His Word into practice, and there are those who do not. The first group, the wise, are like those who build their house upon a rock. But the second group, the foolish, are like those who build upon the sand. Now, I'm no architect, I'm no surveyor, but I do know enough to know that no house built upon sand will survive the storms of life. And no life built upon a sandy foundation will survive the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ when He returns. But those who hear what our Savior has to say and those who put His Word into practice are the ones with the sure foundation. And what a glorious foundation we have in the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, died in our place on Calvary's cross. He took the I deserve from a holy and a righteous God who cannot overlook sin. We have been rescued or redeemed from the dominion of darkness, and we have been brought into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. God has raised us up with Christ, and He has seated us with Him in heavenly places. The Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation of our lives, and His obedience his death and His rising again are the only basis for our salvation. And this gospel is to be obeyed. But crucially, this gospel is to be lived out. Living out the faith, putting the Word of God into practice, requires wisdom. It requires courage. And one reason for this is because we are in a minority we are among the few who are walking the narrow way in contrast to the many who are upon the broad road. Our foundation is sure, but that does not make the Christian walk an easy walk. Christian believers in our Western society today are being confronted all of the time with enforced secularism. We're seeing it in the media. We're seeing it in the workplace. We're seeing it in the political arena, seeing it on in colleges, in universities, and increasingly even in schools. And it is attacking biblical truth, including what we know from Scripture to be the sure foundations for human society. Scripture reveals that marriage between one man and one woman is God's design for the human race. It's crucial to the well-being of human society. Scripture reveals that our identity as either male or female is not something we choose for ourselves. It is a God-given blessing. And Scripture reveals that human beings are individuals created in the image of God. Lives ought to be protected in law and not to be taken in the womb or when old or vulnerable. And yet all of those things are under attack in our nation today. Marriage has been redefined in the laws of our land and in fact throughout the United Kingdom and in fact throughout the British Isles to include same-sex relationships on a par with marriage. Marriage has been repeatedly undermined by ever easier divorce measures. And we're currently witnessing the indoctrination of children in gender ideology, which removes any sense of objective 
biological sex, and we're witnessing the value of human life treated with contempt as calls for abortion on demand and for assisted suicide grow louder and louder. So, remaining confident in the Word of God on those issues is an important means by which we build our house upon the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. Our sovereign Creator God is good. The instructions He gives to creatures on how to live are designed for our best. And if we do not stand upon the Word of God, then both as individuals and also as whole societies, verse 27 of our reading gives the result. It says, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So, as Christian believers seeking to love our neighbor, we must defend those true and those sure foundations. Now, of course, our intentions may be misunderstood. They may even be misrepresented. Although we are motivated by the glory of God and by the good of our neighbor, some people may accuse us of bigotry or hatred or intolerance. But the Lord Jesus Christ has already prepared us for that. Two chapters earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 20 to 12, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And the passage we read from in Matthew 7 reminds us that some of the danger comes from wolves masquerading as sheep. People who claim to be Christian, but yet who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and are opposed to the truths of His Word and opposed to His true church. And sadly, there are examples of that at the moment in the United Kingdom with people professing to be Christian and at the same time campaigning to criminalize faithful Bible teaching through a broad conversion therapy ban. So, as believers, we are in the middle of a conflict. Remaining silent, running away, compromising can all seem like attractive options. But the Lord Jesus Christ prayed to the Father in John 17 for His people, and He said, I pray not that Thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that Thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So, the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to follow Him in this world, not to retreat from it, not to hide from it, not even to limit our involvement solely to evangelism, although, of course, the preaching of the gospel is of central importance to the church. But the gospel also prepares for good works. It is both a saving from and a saving to. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read a description of the Christian believer, and we're described thus. It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So, you cannot trade off obedience versus evangelism. Both are necessary, both are called for, both are intertwined. Yes, we must always remember that our obedience is not about earning salvation. We are only saved through Christ's death in our place on Calvary's cross. We are saved by grace through faith. It is not the work of the Lord Jesus Christ plus our own work. It is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And yet, as the Reformers insisted, although we are saved by faith alone, faith that saves is never alone. True faith will always be followed by obedient living. And for the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the test of true faith. In verse 20 of our reading, He says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So, believers are to be those bearing good fruit, to be recognizable as men and women, putting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ into practice. And we have this great encouragement in Galatians chapter 6. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
So tonight, as we come to think about various issues challenging us as believers in our nation today, let's be encouraged that we have a sure foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ, including a certain hope for the future. And let's remain confident that the Word of God gives us the sure foundations for living in human society as well. So, with those biblical principles in mind, I want to come and look at some of the issues we're facing at the present time. And the first area that I want to address tonight relates to what is being called gender ideology. Scripture is clear in Genesis chapter 1 that our identity as either male or female is central to God's creation of human beings in His image. God has purposefully, deliberately created men and women different from one another, but interdependent upon one another. Men and women are equally made in the image of God, but equal is not the same thing as sameness. Each sex has its own distinct role to play in God's design for the family unit, in God's design for human society, and in God's design for His church. But today, gender ideology is seeking to destroy the distinction between male and female that God in His wisdom and in His goodness has set in place. Gender ideology teaches, it falsely teaches, that every person has a gender identity which may or may not match our biological sex. It claims that a person's subjective internal feelings of gender are who they really are, and that those subjective internal feelings override the physical biology of our bodies. So, that's what gender ideology is telling. But, of course, the truth is that your body is not separate from the real you. The Bible teaches that a person is a coherent whole, both body and soul together. But this idea that a person can be trapped in the wrong gender, or as society puts it, that they are transgender, is an ideology that has taken hold in many areas of our nation's life, including the laws of our land. The 2004 Gender Recognition Act, which applies across the United Kingdom, including in this province, allows an adult to change legal sex, providing they have lived as if they were a member of the opposite sex for at least two years, and they have a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria signed off by two doctors. So, under this legislation in place for almost two decades, a man in his fifties who has fathered children can be issued with a birth certificate from the government stating that he was born female. Now, that is bad enough, but many of you are aware that in the run-up to Christmas, the Scottish Parliament voted overwhelmingly to extend the gender recognition laws in Scotland to allow 16-year-olds to change legal gender. They did away with the two-year waiting period, reduced it to six months, and did away with the requirement of medical sign-off by two doctors. Mercifully, that legislation has been blocked at a Westminster level because of its implications for equality law throughout the United Kingdom. But nonetheless, there are people campaigning for similar measures to be adopted throughout the rest of the UK, including in this province. The impact of gender ideology upon children and young people particularly is increasing. There has been a dramatic rise in the last decade in the number of teenagers claiming to be a different gender. In the year, school year 2009 to 2010, the Gender Identity Development Clinic in London, which is one of the main facilities treating teenagers in this matter, it received 77 referrals. But in the school year 2019 to 2020, it received 2,728 referrals. And many commentators are concerned that the trend is being driven by social influences especially online influences, teenagers going through what are fairly common adolescent struggles are being encouraged to think about themselves as transgender. The Christian Institute has prepared briefings on this topic. We argue that transgenderism can be viewed as a social contagion, and we give important information on how to respond. And some of the leaflets are on the table at the back. 
Uh, you're welcome to help yourself to them uh, before you leave. All of the literature is free, so do take a bargain from a Scotsman tonight, lest it, you not get another opportunity for that. But every year now, hundreds of gender-confused children in the UK are being put on courses of puberty-blocking drugs. The drugs are being described as a living experiment. They've largely unknown long-term consequences, but we do know that they affect bone density, they affect fertility, and they possibly impair brain development. And what is more, in up to 90% of cases, childhood confusion about gender resolves by itself by the end of puberty. But puberty is the very process the drugs are blocking. So almost all of the children taking those blockers go on to receive more damaging hormone treatment. Well, how as Christian believers do we respond to this challenge? Well, we need to be clear about what the Bible teaches in relation to this issue, and we also need to be clear about how to answer the challenges this issue presents. Now, that is true at a public level as we preach the Word of God in our pulpits and declare the Word of God before our nation, but it is also true at a personal level as well. Some of us may have been affected by this issue through friends, through family members, through work colleagues or neighbors, and Christians need both grace and wisdom as we seek to deal with this issue pastorally. We must show grace but also truth to those living transgender lifestyles. We must hold faithfully to the Word of God, showing compassion, but not showing compromise. In 1 John chapter 3, believers are called to love in deed, that is in action, but we're also to love in truth. And specifically, we must continue to hold that it is wrong for the medical profession to deliberately mutilate a healthy body to match the mental wishes of someone who think themselves trapped in the wrong gender. Instead, the medical profession should work to help people come to accept the body they have been born with. Lives are being damaged by the current approach. The number of detransitioners is increasing. These are people who undergo gender reassignment and then regret that decision. One detransitioner told Sky News she had heard from hundreds of people expressing regret for having gone down this line. There are people being left in desperately sad situations where they have done major damage to their physical body. And I want to show a very short video clip in which one such individual shares her tragic story. The lady simply gives her name as Lou and she explains uh, the story and her situation. So we'll play that now. The assumption from the outset was that if I said I was transgender, then I must be. Nobody at any point questioned my motives. The only cure for this would be hormones and surgery. Lou, not her real name, was born a girl. As a child, she experienced gender dysphoria, which intensified with the onset of puberty. I became very self-conscious of my body. I was developing breasts and periods which for me felt like there was an alien crawling out of the inside of my body. I became very depressed. I thought the only explanation for my gender dysphoria must be that I was actually a man. I was struggling with self-harm and had attempted suicide on a number of occasions and was very much told by the community that if you don't transition, you will self-harm and you will kill yourself. I became convinced that my options were transition or die. I didn't understand that the degree of disconnect from and hatred of my body could be considered a mental health problem. At 20, Lou had her breasts removed in a double mastectomy, a decision that now haunts her. 
the darkest moment was when I realised that I had actually looked normal for a girl, that I had actually been slim and pretty, that my body hadn't been grotesque the way I thought it was now. As a result of having transitioned, I will always have a female body that is freakish. I will always have a flat chest and a beard, and there's nothing I can do about that. Well, we must pray about this serious issue. Pray for the protection of children and adults from this harmful ideology. Pray that the dangers of puberty-blocking drugs will be publicly exposed in our nation. And pray for people like the lady in the video who have already been victims of this legislation and policy. I think that her comment was so telling. Nobody thought to tell me this was a mental issue. Everybody said, oh, well, a physical issue will give you hormones and surgery. Uh, so, people have, in effect, been lied to on this. We should pray also for churches and for individual Christian believers that we would be gracious, but also courageous and wise in upholding biblical truth that we are created as either male or female in the image of God. Well, the next area I want to talk about relates to something that is being termed conversion therapy. Politicians across the British Isles, and indeed in several Western European nations, are saying that they want to ban so-called conversion therapy. At a Westminster level, the government is setting out plans to create a new criminal offence, outlawing coercive talking conversion therapy. It's being claimed in the media that there are people in our society trying to coerce those living in homosexuality to live as heterosexuals. And some of the coercive techniques being cited in the media are actually illegal already. Here in Northern Ireland, the Department for Communities at Stormont is also preparing proposals for a ban. Well, from the outset, we need to remember that this phrase, conversion therapy, is a deliberately broad term. It is a term that has been chosen by the LGBT campaign groups. Now, it is true there can be quack therapists about who have exploited people or who have used abusive practices, but the activists want the ban to go much further than that. They want to capture the ordinary work of churches. They are arguing that the new law must cover prayer, preaching, and pastoral conversations that do not affirm the practice of homosexuality or gender identity. So, in other words, they want the criminal law to force Christians to endorse this LGBT agenda. One prominent advocate of a ban is Jane Ozan, and she is a member of the Church of England General Synod. Jane Ozan claims that church prayer ministry is conversion therapy, and she attacks churches for teaching that homosexual practice is sinful. Jane Ozan wants this kind of conversion therapy to become a criminal offence. Paul Brand, an ITV newsreader and also an LGBT campaigner, has said conversion therapy often takes more subtle forms, including prayer and spiritual guidance. And Matthew Heintman, the co-founder of the Ban Conversion Therapy campaign, has said spiritual guidance is really just religious speak for conversion therapy. And the BBC has said conversion therapy involves treatments ranging from psychotherapy to religious teaching and discussion. And Humanists UK have called for the ban to include verbal communication such as confessions or repentances. So, it should be clear to you, what is at stake here is basic teaching on conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ, which involves faith accompanied by repentance. If in certain cases it becomes illegal to call men and women to repentance, then in those cases the gospel itself becomes illegal, 
So everyday church life would be beset by the risk of prosecution. And sadly, many politicians are buying into this agenda. They are muddling the ordinary work of churches with coercive and abusive practices that in the most cases are illegal already. In a debate in Stormont in 2021, a majority of MLAs backed a motion by Ulster Unionist MLA Doug Beattie calling for conversion therapy to be banned in all its forms, presumably including the ordinary work of churches and private family life. These ideas have already been legislated for in the state of Victoria in Australia. Last year, the state of Victoria enacted a conversion therapy ban, and the law there is being cited by activists in other countries, including the UK, as an example of good practice to follow. In the state of Victoria, pastoral advice and prayer that uphold Bible teaching on sexual behavior has been labeled conversion therapy and outlawed. Official guidance on applying the new legislation in Victoria states that the law means not affirming someone's gender identity is unlawful conversion therapy and that parents who do not support their children receiving puberty blocking drugs are breaking the law. The guidance in Victoria also states it would be illegal for a religious leader to tell a member of their congregation that they would be excommunicated if they continue in a same-sex relationship. At a Westminster level, the Equalities Minister Kemi Badnoch has written a letter to MPs promising that the freedom to express the teachings of any religion, as well as everyday religious practice, will not be affected by the ban. But there is intense pressure from activists to include prayer and Bible teaching in a ban. The Christian Institute has commissioned a legal opinion from leading human rights KC Jason Koppel, setting out the impact of such a ban here, and we have shared uh, that legal opinion with politicians and others in the public square. We've also launched the Let Us Pray campaign, who, which has the aim of defending gospel freedom. Its aim is to protect the ordinary work of churches from an overly broad conversion therapy ban. Even if you already get the Christian Institute updates, you can get specific updates from the Let Us Pray campaign at letuspray.uk. There is a broad conversion therapy ban could also impact family life. The public consultation that was held in England suggested that the ban would apply more strictly to those under the age of 18. So there is clear potential for it to interfere with Christian parents raising their children in the faith. A key problem is religious literacy among civil servants and officials. Those who are drafting legislation, they do not always fully understand the implications of what they are proposing. So it is vital that we pray about this issue, pray that the government, politicians would listen to our concerns that they would not outlaw the ordinary work of churches, and pray that the media would acknowledge and report the difference between Christian conversion and so-called conversion therapy, and pray for us in the Christian Institute, myself and my colleagues, as we respond to this serious but challenging issue. Well, moving on uh, to one of the hot-button topics particular to us in Northern Ireland at the present time, and that is the issue of RSC, that is Relationships and Sexuality Education in Northern Ireland schools. Well, what does the Bible have to teach us? Well, it teaches us that children are a precious gift from God, a heritage from the Lord. It teaches us that parents have a duty, have primary responsibility to teach and to train their children and to protect their children from harm. And in Matthew chapter 18, we do read that it is described as a wicked thing to put stumbling blocks in the way of a child or to encourage a child to do evil. So therefore, sexually explicit teaching in the classroom and the promotion of false ideas about gender ought to concern Christian believers, especially Christian parents. 
Changes being made to relationships and sexuality education in Northern Ireland schools are generating controversy. And so Christians need to be informed about what is happening to pray and to respond in a wise and strategic way. So what are the current arrangements? Well, under the law at present, schools within Northern Ireland do have freedom to develop their own RSE policy. The law does set out some limited content which must be covered in post-primary schools, but broadly speaking, the schools can develop their own policy which must be endorsed by the school's board of governors. It must reflect the ethos of the school and parents should be consulted about what their children are taught in RSE. The current guidelines also support the right of parents to have their children educated in accordance with their wishes. Many schools in Northern Ireland were started by churches and were transferred to the state a hundred years ago on the understanding that a Christian ethos would be respected. But what? So there's the limited content set out for RSC at present. So as you can see, it's quite general, quite limited at the present time, and schools can develop it in accordance with their ethos. But what has happened this year? Well, in June, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton Harris MP, introduced the Relationships and Sexuality Education Northern Ireland Amendment Regulations at Westminster. And sadly, MPs voted overwhelmingly by 373 votes to 28 to impose those regulations on Northern Ireland. And those regulations have inserted additional requirements into the statutory minimum curriculum content for RSE in post-primary schools, requiring that pupils receive age-appropriate, comprehensive and scientifically accurate education on sexual and reproductive health and rights covering prevention of early pregnancy and access to abortion. The regulations also require the Department of Education to set out parents' rights to withdraw their children from this teaching and to issue guidance ensuring that the pupils receive that education on sexual and reproductive health and rights, including uh, access to abortion, and that the education received by the pupils be age-appropriate, comprehensive, and scientifically accurate. The new guidance is to be in place by the beginning of January of next year and will be mandatory for all state-funded post-primary schools. So there is a risk here that activists could exploit the new requirements to impose sexually explicit teaching and materials on post-primary schools. Several public bodies are already campaigning for this. So although this has been voted in by MPs in England and Scotland in the main, there are public bodies here and public figures campaigning for it locally as well. Earlier this year, a panel appointed by the Department for Communities at Stormont publicly criticised the current teaching of RSC in this province. And interestingly, that panel included representatives from the Rainbow Project, Transgender NI and Hair NI, which is an organization advocating on behalf of lesbian groups. Then in April, the Education and Training Inspectorate in Northern Ireland called for increased teaching on abortion, gender identity, and LGBTQ plus issues in Northern Ireland schools. And in June, within a week of the Secretary of State laying those regulations at Westminster, the Human Rights Commission here in Northern Ireland published a report calling for all elements of comprehensive RSE to be forced on schools here. The Human Rights Commission criticized schools for teaching abstinence from sexual activity outside of marriage and faithfulness within marriage. The Commission also questioned whether children should be allowed to express views that disagree with the LGBT agenda. And the Commission's report made negative comment about two-thirds of the schools in its study because they had referenced (coughs) pro-life values in their RSE policies. And there have been local politicians campaigning for the same changes. The Alliance 
party has publicly welcomed the new RSE regulations and welcomed particularly the requirement to teach about accessing abortion in post-primary schools. Connie Egan, MLA, the uh, uh, education spokesman at Stormont for the Alliance, had been preparing a private member's bill to introduce a standard RSE curriculum across all Northern Irish schools. So there is campaign going on for this at a local level as well. So what about this banner of comprehensive RSE? Well, the Christian Institute is aware of schools in Scotland and in England where explicit materials have been introduced into classrooms under the banner of comprehensive RSE. In some cases, children have been taught sex positivity, that is where any sexual practice is presented as acceptable so long as it has consent. And contentious gender ideology has been presented as fact, denying the biological reality of male or female. RSE was made compulsory in English schools in 2020, and many schools in England have now been inviting external organisations in to take classes on the topic or to provide teaching materials and lesson plans. Some of them have promoted extreme ideologies. Earlier this year, English MP Miriam Cates commissioned a report which highlighted evidence of unsuitable materials and sexual indoctrination on a wide scale in English schools. Some of the examples her report highlighted are too graphic to describe in a meeting like this. And in response to Miriam Kate's report, the head of Ofsted, Amanda Spielman, warned that children in England are being taught sex education lessons that have no basis in biological fact. In fact, some pupils in some English secondary schools have been taught that there are a hundred different genders. And on the Isle of Man, in February of this year, the Manx government suspended all sex education lessons there and launched an independent inquiry after 11-year-old pupils were taught that there are 73 different genders. And other pupils in that same year group were given uh, very explicit lessons on some of these issues. So there is a risk that the requirement for comprehensive RSE could become a Trojan horse to introduce anti-Christian ideology and explicit materials into Northern Ireland schools. The new regulations state that these additional elements of RSE must be taught with scientific accuracy. So they mean by that, it's interpreted to mean uh, the phrase scientific accuracy, the teaching or presentation of information outside of a moral, ethical or religious framework. So people will be arguing, oh, we don't teach that from an ethical or a religious perspective, we teach it scientifically, with scientific accuracy. Well, it's, scientific accuracy can work both ways, and it will be interesting to see whether scientific facts about the development of an unborn child in the womb, or scientific facts about gender being unchangeable will be taught or will be brushed aside. Helpfully, in answer to parliamentary questions in July, Government Minister Baroness Barron confirmed that the new regulations will allow pupils to be withdrawn from education on sexual and reproductive health and rights or elements of that education at the request of a parent. And the Department of Education has included this within their public consultation. However, by way of caution, we need to keep in mind that in England, parents are permitted to withdraw their child from the sex education element of RAC, but not from the relationships part. So what is happening now? Well, the Department of Education launched its public consultation the week before last. It focuses on the parental right of withdrawal from those new elements of RAC, and that consultation runs until the 24th of November. The Christian Institute will be keeping those on our mailing list up to date with developments on this issue. So if you don't already get our mailings, then do fill your details on one of the cards and leave the card in the grey basket on the literature table at the back. And that's, uh, that's free. It's a free offer from a Scotsman too. And we'll keep you up to date. We will be sending out 
to those on our mailing list in the coming weeks advice and guidance on how to respond to that consultation. We can be sure that those who want RSE to go in a more liberal direction will be responding to that consultation. So Christians do need to respond and present the case for the protection of our children. Please also pray, sorry, please also pray for a clear and wise response to this issue from parents, from teachers, from school governors and the public opposing gender ideology and explicit teaching in schools. Pray for the protection of children from prom the promotion of harmful practices. Pray that the Department of Education will not yield to the extreme demands of activists. And pray for God's help and protection upon the Christian Institute, myself and my colleagues, as we work on this serious issue. But the last area to talk about a little bit more briefly relates to the work of the Christian Institute's Legal Defence Fund. Many of you will know that the Christian, operate, Christian Institute operates a legal defence fund to help Christian believers who are facing hostility because of their faith in workplaces and in situations in the United Kingdom. Most people here will recall the case of Asher's Baking Company. I've spoken about that case here before in Lisburn, the Christian family-run bakery in Newton Abbey that were taken through the courts by the Equality Commission after they politely declined to produce a campaign cake with slogans calling for same-sex marriage. And after a four-year legal battle, uh, the MacArthur family who own Asher's Baking Company were cleared of all wrongdoing at the UK Supreme Court. And we give thanks to God for that judgment. If you want to read about some of the other cases, do take a copy of our briefing on the Legal Defence Fund work from the literature table at the end. But I want to briefly mention to you a case from Scotland uh, where there was some good news uh, just at the very beginning of last year, uh, where in relation to Kenneth Ferguson, who was the chief executive of the Robertson Trust, the largest grant-making trust in Scotland, and he was dismissed from his job because of his Christian beliefs about marriage. And rather than me speak, I want to show a short video clip in which Kenneth Ferguson explains his own story. I was the chief executive of the Robertson Trust, the largest charitable funder in Scotland. I'd been with them nearly 10 years, and in that 10 years, we really were creating a huge impact in terms of the support of the charity sector in Scotland. I was discriminated against by the Trust, and I was discriminated against personally by the Chair of the Trust. I'm an elder and the treasurer at Stirling Free Church. The church is growing, and the minister came to me and said, look, uh, the church has really out, outgrown the premises that we were renting. Is there any chance of us being able to, to rent the space which you're about to open in Stirling for charities? And I said, well, I'm obviously conflicted, but speak to my team and I see if we can do it because you are a charity. It's exactly what uh, this, this space is to be used for. And so they, they agreed terms and uh, they uh, signed a license to, to occupy and uh, off we set. And then on the Friday before uh, the, the barracks were due to formally open, uh, my chair, Sharon McPherson, uh, she came to visit it. And at that point, uh, the staff team were putting out the chairs for the church on the Sunday. And she said, what's this for? And uh, they explained, they said, oh, it's for Kenneth's church. And uh, she said, which church? And they said, a Stirling Free Church. And she said, they don't believe in same-sex marriage, not the Free Church. And so I went in on Monday morning to find her sitting in my office. And uh, she looked at me and said, are you an elder in the Free Church? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, are you aware that they've rented space? I said, yes, of course, but I've had nothing to do with it because I've absented myself from it. And uh, she said, uh, there's going to be a formal investigation. I was then issued a letter to say, uh, you have to appear at the lawyer's office on the Monday. I was given this on the Thursday night at six o'clock. And an outcome of this will be that potentially you'll be sacked. And as you can imagine, that was horrendous. But well, interestingly, one of the emails that came into my inbox absolutely struck me. It was as if God was speaking to me directly there. And it said, do not be afraid of this vast army. Stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. 
and it's from Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 15 to 17. And I've read it and reread it. I just couldn't believe it. It just felt as if God was really speaking to me at this incredibly difficult time. On the Monday at 4.30, I get this email through saying, you are dismissed with immediate effect. The press statement went out and they said that I had a stepped down as chief executive. You know, just lies, it wasn't true. And the trust were very keen for me to, to settle, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And to be honest, without the Christian Institute, I would have had to sign that because I could not have taken on that battle. The CI were fantastic, an absolute godsend to me. I didn't know how I was going to try and deal with this, but the CI just brought a whole confidence, a whole calmness to the situation and said, yeah, let's have a look at it and see what uh, they, they could do to help. So what happened was uh, we went into court and uh, Seanag McPherson, the chair, was being cross-examined by our barrister and uh, he said to her, how do you know this? How can you be certain of what you've just said? And she said, I wrote it in a notebook. And he turned to the judge and said, I would petition the court that this notebook be released because it hadn't been released to us. And the judge said, yes, it should be released. And this notebook was basically verbatim her conversations with all the other trustees saying, he's got to go, we've got to sack him. And this is before they'd even met me, on, uh, before they'd even started anything of the investigation or any of the process. And my barrister after it said, I've been in court a long time. And he said, I wouldn't use this phrase lightly, but that was miraculous. He said, I have never seen something come from nowhere which has had such a profound impact on the case. And I said, well, people have been praying. And he said, well, whoever it was, those were powerful prayers. The day before the, the, the result came out, um, both my wife and I read the Bible in a year, and we just keep reading through it. And the reading that day was, tomorrow, go out tomorrow, for tomorrow you will see the deliverance of the Lord. And then the next day, out of the blue, the judgment came. God was saying to me, tomorrow you will see, you will see the deliverance. And it was, and it was a, a clear vindication of our position. We won on the, the unfair dismissal and the judgment was really damning. Praise God for the way that he has enabled me to really hold fast to the truth that is in his scriptures to say, don't worry, this battle is not yours. Stand and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. And that has been my, my lasting impression of this. I have been able to stand and see the deliverance of the Lord. Well, we do thank God for his overruling in that case and also for the related ruling in favor of Stirling Free Church against the Robertson Trust as well. But the cases you hear about, like Kenneth Ferguson, like the Asher's Baking Company, the cases you hear about are simply the tip of the iceberg. Every day, behind the scenes, the Christian Institute's legal team are giving advice to Christians who are in all sorts of difficulty because of their stand for biblical truth, and that includes helping Christians who are involved in open-air preaching and evangelism, helping Christian couples who are dealing with the adoption and fostering process, helping Christians in business avoid problems arising under the Equality Act, and assisting Christians in the workplace who are under pressure to say things they do not believe. So if you or any Christian believer you know experience difficulty because of your stand on an issue of biblical principle, then do get in touch with us. We may well be able to help you. And most, the vast majority of the people who contact the Christian Institute for Advice and Help, their story never goes on the front page of a newspaper. It's resolved with a little bit of advice or a letter being written for them. And it may be we are able to help you. Well, thank you so much for listening. Just before uh, I finish, uh, I would want to leave you with a couple of practical things we can do in response to these issues. The first one I've already mentioned, if we want to be a Christian influence in our society, want to affect Christian influence upon those in government and public authority, then we have to be informed about what is going on. Being informed or being aware of what's happening is the first step to being a Christian influence. Most of us don't have the time 
to go through the newspapers every day or to watch debates in Parliament, on television, on the radio, on the internet, or to read the minutes of local council meetings. But the Christian Institute uh, can help keep you informed. Uh, as I've said, on your seats there are little cards like these. If you don't already get our mailings, I know some already do, but if you don't already get them, pop your name and address on the card, leave the card in the grey basket on the literature table, and you can join our mailing list for free. Even in Scotland, there are people who have joined our mailing list, and we don't bombard people with literature, but we do write out to you as issues arise. We tell you what to pray for. We tell you what to do in response. So if you don't get our updates, do take the card and fill it in. If you do get the updates already, why not give the card to a Christian friend who's not here? Tell them what's happening. Tell them what they're missing out on and encourage them to sign up if they wish. The second thing we must do about these issues is to pray. And I've actually spoken here in Lisburn Free Presbyterian before on 1 Timothy chapter 2, where we're called to pray for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We're called to pray for those ruling our nation so that we would have the freedom to live godly lives in our day-to-day -day business and workplaces and freedom to share the gospel in our land. Those things are being challenged. So Christians ought to be much more in prayer for those ruling the nation. Pray particularly for the Department of Education as it deals with this consultation on RSE here at the present time. And finally, we ought to write letters from time to time. Those who get our mailings know we ask you to write to your MP or your MLAs. We ask you to respond to public consultations. And can I encourage you to do so? The reason we ask people to do that is because we believe it is the most strategic way that Christians can be an influence on that particular issue at that particular point in time. But if Christians do not respond to those calls for action, then that influence will be lost. We will be writing to people in the coming weeks regarding the RSE consultation. And it is so important that we do make use of that opportunity, that we do write in and that we do make concerns known because you can be sure that those who want to push RSE in the more liberal direction will be making full use of the consultation to argue the opposite. So it's incumbent upon us uh, to take the effort and take the stand for the protection of our children and also for others involved in education. Thank you so much for allowing me to share tonight. I'll hand back to Roger. Thank you. Well, Callum, thank you so much for coming along this evening and for sharing with us. There's a lot to take in there. And as it's been said, there's literature on the table at the back that covers a lot of the areas that have been spoken about tonight. So take some of the literature with you and pray over it and sign up as well for that newsletter. Callum will be at the door. Maybe that there's questions that you have and you feel that Callum might be of assistance in answering those questions. He's going to be at the door for a little while after and I'm sure he'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. And then the Rally in the Martyrs, is that the 30th of this month? And that's a Saturday night, 7 o'clock, in the Martyrs Memorial, Saturday the 30th of this month, in the Martyrs Memorial, 7 o'clock, and the focus that night is on RSE, so you can go along there that night as well. We'll get down to a season of prayer and just make the most of the time that's left, and just do pray for the work of the Christian Institute, and we're so thankful for them. It's a very uh, needy work that they do. Uh, bringing people up to speed with what's going on and also helping people that have got into uh, deep waters with the law. And we thank God for the work of the Christian Institute. Do pray tonight for you.